Brother Bobby Lyles on that last boom, boom. I like that. Take your songbooks, turn to hymn number 435. There it is. Now, if you really belt it out, he'll come in strong. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 435. We had 86 in jail attendance today with 19 trust in Christ as Savior. Wonderful day in church, full house, folks saved and baptized. We're glad you're here. Let's sing together hymn number 435. What a wonderful change my life has been wrought on that first verse. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Blood of joy o'er my soul like the sea. Sing it on that third verse. I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure since Jesus came into my heart. And no dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscure since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Now I have to confess something to you. This is one of those fun songs for a congregational song leader. Because if you don't take a good breath, then I get to see you kind of wobble and waver as I hold that note and you just kind of <gasps> and fall over. It's kind of fun, actually. Take a good, strong breath, and then you can just belt it out. Preacher would probably say bellow it out, something like that. Beller. <laughs> Is that northern? No, I'm just kidding. I've been up north a little bit, so I got a little bit of that Bell. accent back. Bellow. <laughs> Bello. <laughs> That's what he says. Beller it out here in the south. I was just talking to somebody about how in the South, uh, I believe that every vowel has to be made into two sounds. Is that correct? Hey, right? Is that what it sounds like? All right, let's sing it like we mean it tonight. On that last verse, I shall go to that city. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came into my heart. Get a good breath now. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Lots of joy on my soul like the sea. You are so grateful for the time that Jesus came into your heart. Turn to hymn number 45, if you would. It's still the blood that saves from sin. It's still the blood that cleanses within just that course together. And it's still the blood that saves from sin. It's still the blood that cleanses within from the heart. To the depths of the sea, it's still the blood of Jesus that brings victory. You know, the blood of Christ is not just something that we shout about. It's not just a, a buzzword for Baptist people to just shout out amen. It truly is the thing that saves us from sin. And I hope that you think about the fact that Jesus shed his blood for your sins and for my sins. I heard this morning that it's amazing. Brother Nate saying that it's an amazing thing that God would, would want a relationship with me. And I know me and you know you. But he still shed his blood for our sins. Let's sing that chorus one more time and let's reflect 
on what Jesus did for us. Sing that chorus again. And it's still the blood that saves from sin. It's still Wonderful singing tonight. You may be seated. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Would you stand with me? Hymn number 302, if you need it. We'll sing that chorus together. He gave his life for mine. It's a wonderful thing to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be justified forever. Great singing. Let's turn around and do a little handshake and greet one another. We're glad you're here tonight. Thank you for coming to church.
I think you're enjoying shaking hands tonight, but let's sing that chorus one more time. Actually, let's sing the verse. Life has purpose now. But Nathan, I'm, I'm sorry to throw you a curveball right there. I don't know if you can pull it up there, but I'll sing it strong. Many of you know it. Life has purpose now. Life has purpose now it never had before. There is meaning to each day and even more. For a joy and peace I can't explain is mine. Since I found new life in Christ my Lord divine. Join on the chorus. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified forever. Amen. Good singing. Thank you. you. May be seated. Just a couple of announcements as our ushers make the way uh, to the front for the offering. We have a youth summit coming up. I'll have Kurt come and say a word about that here in just a moment. And uh, then uh, just, um, uh, just a lot of things going on as we wind down and get ready for the school year. Summer is ending. And uh, we're asking God just to give us a good, strong finish to the summer. A wonderful crowd today. We're thankful for those who were saved. I have this note from Miss, Mrs. Tammy Woodard. And she writes these lines to our church, to my family at Franklin Road Baptist Church. I would like to thank everyone for the cards and the flowers and meals. It has meant so much to my family, but mostly I would like to let you know how much all of your prayers have meant to us. I know there is no way we could have made it through the last two weeks without all the prayers being lifted up for us. It is truly humbling to think about all the love that has been shown to us, and it is a true meaning of family. Thank you again, Tammy Woodard. So I come in right up there just a moment ago, and she was here this morning and with her family. I want you to just pray now as they uh, just get their feet back under them. And um, the funeral service was a very graceful service, a wonderful crowd. This is a big auditorium to fill up for a funeral service, and, and the main floor was pretty full. There was the balcony had some folks in it. And that is a good testimony of, first of all, Brother Jimmy Woodard, but secondly, of our church family and their love. And I appreciate you gathering around Miss Tammy and their family during this time. I know they do as well. Um, then uh, also, before we go to prayer, I'll have Brother Kirk come, and he can take us to prayer uh, for the offering. He has some announcements about the Youth Summit. Why don't you pray for Lori Olson's dad, Brother Joel Kuhn, who had a heart attack this past week and will have open heart surgery on Tuesday. Also, please pray for my brother-in-law, Jerry Mounts. This is my wife's sister's uh, husband over in Harriman, Tennessee, and he was diagnosed with cancer just last week, and um, they're just uh, brokenhearted about it. He goes to a, the oncologist this week and uh, to find out what the, uh, what the uh, line of treatment will be, and so I want you to pray for Jerry uh, as he goes to just retired not long ago, and, uh, and now he looks like he'll battle this, unless God intervenes and heals him, and we ask you to pray that he will do just that. Uh, Mrs. Sherry De Silva went home today to the hospital, and got a quick little text from Tom. He was excited to finally get everybody home. Now maybe they begin to new, enjoy that new baby girl. And uh, then also we're praying for Mrs. Martha Burns in the past of her twin sister and Steve Morrison in the past of his mother, June Bigler. And then also for Ruth Brown, she heals. We announced this morning for the first time David Mosley is going to have some cancer surgery on August the 22nd. And I want you to be praying for him. He'll have that at Vanderbilt. We're asking God for total healing for his body. And if he had his way, he would just ask the Lord to heal him before he had the surgery. That would be a wonderful thing. And it's just not been that long ago that he had some major surgery. And so I want you to pray for uh, Brother David. Also, Brother Mike Van Horn, as he heals from elbow surgery. And then Brother Les Wilson, he heals from knee surgery. Mrs. Glenn and Mario Marino's husband, uh, Louis, is in the hospital with some heart difficulty. Asking God to bless there as well. Brother Kurt, once you come, tell us a little bit about the conference coming up and pray for the offering. We are excited about the next few days with our teenagers. Um, the Youth Summit begins tomorrow evening. As a matter of fact, there's a whole lot of details I want to give you or tell you about just quickly about that uh, Youth Summit. And I ask you, first of all, and most importantly, for you to pray. Um, we want God to do something special. I had a man text me this afternoon and said that he just felt like God had something great in store for our young people this week. And I, I believe that with all my heart. And I'm thankful for their prayers. There is an information placard or card outside in the hallways has a basic schedule on the back that schedule has been adjusted just a little bit and on the tables out past all the decorations all the be, be careful as you go through by the way and uh, out that way there'll be on a table that has a uh, completed schedule updated schedule 
um, as of this afternoon, actually, there was one more small change we made this afternoon to that schedule. That's available to you. You can come and be a part of any service that you'd like to come and be a part of. We invite you as a church family to be here. This is just our teenagers. We're not inviting other, other churches in this year. We just wanted to have this for our teens this year. And uh, that schedule is right out here on the, uh, on the table and uh, with a little information sheet with it as well. Um, and, and one, again, invite you to everything you'd like to be involved with. There are two functions or, or events that we're going to with the teenagers uh, over the course of the next two days. Tomorrow evening, uh, we'll have our first service. Brother Jordan Dow is coming in to preach for us for that first service. Looking forward to a great service there. As soon as the service is over, we're loading up on buses and headed to, to Antioch, Tennessee, to the Ford Ice Skating Rink. Um, we are exclusively renting out the, the roller, or ice skating rink so that uh, our kids can enjoy the ice skating. And, and uh, we have a, a, uh, a block that we have set aside, two-hour time block. And uh, I'm inviting you as a church family. Pastor gave the okay on this as well. I'm inviting you as a church family. If you'd like to go ice skating with us, um, there's a little small information sheet, gold or whatever color that is, out here on the table uh, that tells you the directions, tells you the time, tells you all that. There is a waiver <clears throat> uh, for some of us. Uh, that's actually a waiver for all of us. Uh, my wife was telling her girls in her Sunday school class this morning as I walked in her class, she said, uh, that ice is hard. And when you hit, it hurts. And, and she's right, it does. And so make sure your insurance is paid up. But we are inviting you as a church family. Information about it's right here. That is all available right out there on the table as well. And uh, you're invited as a church family, not just teenagers, but a church family. You're invited free of charge. If you want to go ice skating tomorrow evening, it's a late night. Uh, I think it's 1230 to 1:30. You don't have to stay the whole time. Excuse me. 10.30 to 12.30. I get the right time. 10.30 to 12.30. Still a late night, but we want you to go and, and have fun with us if you'd like to. And uh, again, free of charge. The, the delegates, they have a, the, the students who come, they have a fee they're paying for the conference. But that is for the young people. Then also, Tuesday morning, this is, this is exciting. And uh, we are taking the teens to the Nashville Shores Water Park. And it doesn't sound very independent fundamental, but let me explain so you'll understand. It is very independent, very fundamental. And uh, we are renting out the entire water park for our young people. And uh, there will not be anyone else out there except for lifeguards, and they will be properly clothed too. I didn't ask them. They, they told me that uh, all of the lady lifeguards will be wearing knee-link shorts and a T-shirt over the top of their bathing suits. They'll be with the girls. We'll have guys with the guys. Anyway, I'm saying that to say this. We are, we are renting out the entire park. Girls will be on one side of the park for an hour, and guys will be on the other side of the park, and they will pass never one another. They'll go opposite sides of the parks, and they'll go the other side. And uh, we are as well inviting you as a church family to come and go with us to Nashville Shores. Um, they will not have children's functions necessarily. They have water slides and that sort of thing. Uh, but they're only opening up the water slides and the big wave pool and all that stuff. But we'll, we'll have a good time with that as well. That is early Tuesday morning. So some of your early birds, if you're too late going ice skating, you want to go to the water park, you're welcome to join us. Again, free of charge for you. Uh, we'd love for you to go. That's 7.30 in the morning to 9.30 in the morning at the water park. We'll leave here about 6.30. And a purple information sheet out there on the table if you're interested in that. And uh, no waivers necessary there, though. And, uh, but we also then followed up with a July journey at the end. Um, Brother Caleb Sargent, unfortunately, is not able to be with us. He was scheduled to come in and help preach for us as well. But in his stead, we have the esteemed evangelist Otis Duhart preaching in his place. So, uh, so uh, Brother Duhart will be preaching in, in Brother Sargent's place. The schedule's already printed. You can see the schedule. We invite you to come. Be a part of this, this wonderful conference. And uh, Lord willing, next few years, we'll blow it out of the, out of the water and grow it immensely. But uh, this year, we wanted it just for our young people. Have a great time. It will conclude Wednesday night with our esteemed pastor preaching the final closeout service Wednesday night. And let me encourage you, church family, be here Wednesday night. It's not, this is not for the teenagers only. This is for all of us. And we're asking for God to send revival to our whole church family. Whole lot of information there. These young people, I could say this real quickly, need to meet my daughter right over here after the service. Becca, Becca Price, Lauren Courtney, Matthew Dumper, Adam Park, uh, Adam Baker, Jessica Zuniga, Ethan Van Hook, Josh Stanzak, uh, Alex Hartman, trying to read writing here, sorry, uh, Christopher Pope, Nick Lauer, Trip Walker, Amanda Nix, Jessica Hunter, just a few more, Brother Hughes, Lindsey Atwood, Megan Bizard, Greg McCoy, and Daniel McGrath, just right over here. Uh, right after the service is over and we'll pray and we'll take our offering sorry men I had you stand there a long time let's pray and we'll take the offering Lord we thank you for your goodness and Lord we do ask for your presence in this service tonight uh, Lord it's been great to be in your house to hear the singing and, and the fellowship with fellow believers uh, 
Lord, it's a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. And Lord, it's a blessing from you. And Lord, we pray for those requests that Pastor mentioned just a few moments ago. Um, many in great need. And Lord, we pray you'd meet each family's need in a special way. Thank you for the blessings you've given. Lord, bless the service. Bless the offering. Help us all to have a part in giving back to you a portion, Lord, of what you've blessed us with. You've been so good to us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. of you realize that that's Bobby and normally he sits back here and plays the tuba. I want to hear him play that song on the tuba. <laughs> that would be great. Hymn number 89 if you would. Mansion over the hilltop. It's been a great time to be in God's house tonight. We've had a lot of fun and we've sung some enjoyable songs. We've heard some enjoyable things. But let's ask God to speak to our hearts here in just a little bit as our pastor comes and preaches the word of God for us. Would you stand with me? I've got a mansion over the hilltop. I'm satisfied with just cottage below, but I'm looking forward to that mansion. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. to hymn number 77. Oh, that will be glory for me when by His grace I shall look on His face. That will be glory. On that first verse. 
When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me, when by His grace I shall look on His face, that will be glory, be glory. Ah, oh, it's a beautiful chorus. Would you sing one more time with me as we dismiss our three, four, five, and six-year-olds? Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me, when by His grace I shall look on His face, that will Wonderful singing tonight. You may be seated. Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear now is at stake humbling your heart to god saves from the chastening rod seek the way pilgrims trod christians awake jesus is coming, jesus is coming soon morning or night, morning or night or Thank you, man. That's a great song. I love to hear them sing, don't you? And uh, I always like to spread these guys out across the and hear men's voices. I like ladies' voices, too, but just wonderful music tonight. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 14 in the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles chapter 14. And um, this was uh, clarifying just some things Brother Kurt said about uh, youth conference. So I think you fill out that, uh, is it goldenrod or orange 
sheet, I think, if you're going ice skating. And then he said this. He said, um, and then you'll need to fill out a, an accident waiver if you're going ice skating. I think that's what he said. So what he said? Yeah, the orange one or kind of, he said it was kind of like he. And then he said this. He said, and then for uh, the water park, I think you fill out the purple one, but you don't have to fill out an accident waiver. So I, my, my brain starts working here. I'm thinking, so it's okay to hit your head on the ice, but it's not, a, it, it's, it, it's not okay to hit your head on ice, but it's okay to drown. <laughs> I, I guess that's how that works. I'm not sure. I'm kidding. But that's kind of make you think, doesn't it? I had another note here he did not read. Mike James asked if he could just go and lay down on the ice and not skate. It's been so hot. <laughs> And twirl around, make a snow angel. <laughs> then Ted Bratcher asked if he could save money by not renting skates and just come in his Sunday shoes. <laughs> so, so we'll get those answered so you men will know what to do about that. <laughs> Let's stand together, please, reading God's Word. And uh, Second Chronicles chapter 14. Stick with me, you all are going to be sitting for a while. And uh, my wife is in the nursery tonight, so that'll I give you a little cue. Uh, would you just let me read just a lengthy passage because I want you to get the story. And uh, Jer Jeroboam and Rehoboam had divided the nation of Israel, and uh, Jeroboam had done wrong. And then, of course, um, Asa, we'll read about here, was a good king. This is after the death of Solomon. They had been in a terrible condition under King Abijah and... Uh, he dies, and Asa takes over. Verse 1, So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. In his days the land was quiet ten years. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places, and brake down the images, and cut down the groves. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers, and to do the law and the commandment. Also, he took away all out of all of the cities of Judah, the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. And he built fenced cities in Judah, for the land had rest and had no war on those years, because the Lord had given him rest. Therefore he said unto Judah, Let us build these cities and make about them walls and towers and gates and bars while the land is yet before us, because we have sought the Lord our God. Key phrase there, seeking the Lord. We've sought the Lord. Our God, And we have sought him, and he hath given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. And Asa had an army of men that bare targets and spears out of Judah, 300,000. And out of Benjamin that bare shields and drew bows, 204 score thousand. That's about 280,000, 300,000, about 580,000 men total. All these were mighty men of valor. They came out against them, Zerah the Ethiopian with a host of a thousand thousand that's about a million there and 300 chariots that's about 300 army tanks and came to Marisha then Asa went out against him and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephathah at Marisha and Asa cried unto the Lord his God that means he prayed and he said Lord it is nothing with thee to help whether with many or with them that have no power help us O Lord our God for we rest on thee and in thy name we go against this multitude O Lord Thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with him pursued them to Gerer, and the Ethiopians were overthrown, that they could not recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host, and they carried away very much spoil. And they smote all the cities round about Gerer, for the fear of the Lord came upon them, and they spoiled all the cities, and there was exceeding much spoil in them. They smote all the tents of the cattle, of, of the cattle carried away the sheep and the camels in abundance, and returned to Jerusalem. Verse chapter 15. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa, and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if ye seek him... He will be found of you, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season, Israel, that's the sister nation now of Judah, now for a long season, Israel hath, not, hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest, without law. 
when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor that is speaking of Israel now, nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. And the nation was destroyed of nation, city of, of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. We're talking about now Israel, who never had a good king. Be strong, therefore, he tells Asa. Let not your hands be weak, for ye work, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oda, the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of the land and of Judah and Benjamin, now the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim, and renewed the altar of the Lord. There, that was before the porch of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin, the strangers of them, with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon. For they fell out to Israel, out of Israel in abundance, when they saw that the Lord God, his God, was with them. In other words, these people in Israel saw that God was with Judah. So they started going to church in Judah, you might say. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month in the 15th year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had brought, 700 oxen, 7,000 sheep. I want you to read verse 12 with me together in unison. Verse 12, ready? And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. I'll read verse 13. The whosoever shall not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire. And he was found of them. And the Lord gave them rest round about. That little phrase in chapter 15, verse 12, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seeking the Lord is important. Isaiah 55, 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first, in the New Testament, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto thee. Seeking the Lord. We're living in an age of non commitment. We'll commit to certain things which we think benefit us worldwide, but in our Christian world, people are committing to God less and less. And I want to speak on this subject tonight a covenant to seek the God of our fathers. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Teach us tonight and challenge us and help us, Lord, to be ready to make decisions for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. This evening I want to begin with three basic principles about God. First of all, there is only one true God. Can somebody say amen right there? There is not a multiplicity of gods. There's one God. There's, we don't have a God that reveals himself in other religions. There's one God, the God of the Bible. Jehovah God. Secondly, he can be found by anyone who seeks him. I believe that. In the most pagan nation in the world, the Bible says if you seek the Lord, he'll be, you'll be, found, he'll be found of you. And thirdly, he does not forsake those who find him. It is man that forsakes God. We're the one that moves. And though God is always there for us, when we come home to him, we're the ones that turn our backs on God. Sometimes we throw up our hands and we say, God, why did you leave me? And he would love to be able to say to you, why did you leave me? And so uh, with over 7 billion people on planet Earth, over half of them have never heard of the one true God, and the other half has heard of the one true God, but the majority of those do not seek him. That puts us in a, a lot of trouble because today, by and large, we're living in a godless world, and uh, few have, few have any, any desire to change any of this. That's why we need revival. We need to rally people to have a desire to change this and seek after God. You know, it matters little to most folks that God, the God that created man in his image and for his pleasure, and at the, at, at the, at the same time, God created this beautiful earth for all of us to enjoy that we don't want to do more for him, as I preached this morning. Paul said it like this. 
in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And we understand that that, that is our base condition as unsaved people. We're wretched, we're blind, and um, we do not naturally seek after God without the Spirit of God living inside of us. And so it is the Spirit of God that gives us the desire to seek after God, to chase after God. As Christians, we all know that the greatest experience that anyone can ever enjoy is to find the one true God. We also understand the greatest tragedy is to go through life and never find that one true God. And the greatest offense is to go through life and find the one true God and then yet not live for Him. That's the condition of many today. Israel, Judah's sister nation was guilty of this. We find in verse number 3, Now for a long season Israel hath, hath been without the true God. They had the true God, but they turned their back on the true God. And that was the condition of Israel's sister, or Judah's sister nation, Israel. So the prophet said, uh, they don't have the true God right now, but Judah did. And in our text tonight, Judah is in danger of forsaking that one true God. A king dies, and another king takes his place. His name is Asa. There's other places in the Scripture that he's written about. But we bring you to this instance for a reason. I want to show you three things. First of all, I'd like to show you tonight Judah's reward for chasing after God, the Judah's reward for seeking after the God, Judah's, Judah's reward. Seeking the Lord brings a reward, and these people sought early to follow after the Lord. In verses 1 through 15 in chapter 14, the king and the people chose to seek the Lord God, and he rewarded them with blessings. And this is true of any person. It's true of any church. It's true of any nation. The psalmist said this about nations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And so uh, Israel, or excuse me, Judah was rewarded. I have just a couple things that I want to want you to make note of that they were rewarded. First of all, they were rewarded with peace. Just coming out of civil war under the former king, the Bible says in verse number 1 that they had 10 years of peace. 10 years of peace and quiet, no saber rallying. Verse number 5 said that the kingdom was quiet before them. And we understand that that is due to the fact that they sought after the Lord. And one verse here, it says, uh, verse number six, the last part, because the Lord had given him rest. So God, God was pleased now that Judah was chasing after God, seeking God, so God just made everything fall into place. And uh, I think that's, it's a wonderful thing to just do the right thing in your life and watch God control the events in your life. And that's what was going on here. They had peace. Secondly, they had prosperity. Verses 6 and 7 talks about new buildings and a, being built and, and, and a good economy and, and uh, things were just prospering. Notice in verse number uh, 7, they built uh, these cities and they went ahead and built them with walls and towers and gates and bars. And notice the phrase, while the land was yet before them. In other words, during this time of peace and prosperity, they understood that they were, they were given this rest by God, but they felt like that while they're in this restful period, they need to... They need to, to uh, build up just a little bit and protect themselves because they knew the nature of humanity and people would be up and down with living for God and there would come a time maybe they would need those walls and they'd need the bars and the gates and all of that. You know, uh, I was thinking about building walls and, and barriers and there are two prevailing philosophies regarding how Christians ought to live their lives in this world. One is more of a conservative philosophy. One is a very liberal philosophy, wide open with no barriers. One philosophy builds walls for protection, and one says that walls are barriers that isolate us from people. There, is a, there are religions and churches, especially even in, in our own movement, there are, there are people that are tearing down the barriers and tearing down the walls because they want freedom and they want tolerance and they, want, uh, they don't want to preach on sin anymore and they don't want to maybe maintain some of the safeguards that, that the church put in place by our forefathers. And so uh, they want a, a, a more open society, a more open way to, to get to God and all those things. But it's a strange thing. One says walls are protection. One says they're barriers. But yet we want America to build walls around it, as us. We build walls a, around ourselves for sickness. 
I mean, we, we want to have preventative medicine. We don't want to get sick, so therefore there are certain things we, we, we do. In other words, we wear our scarf to keep from getting the cold. I don't wear a scarf. By the way, if you ladies in this culture don't wear a scarf, that'd be okay too. You'll get that in a little bit. But uh, we, we've set these barriers up. Uh, parents, if we're smart, we, we build walls around our kids. But yet when it comes to church work, we want to tear down walls. Uh, I, I want to build walls around us to protect us. I think it's wise. I think it's wise for America. For when Solomon was, was young, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes and uh, uh, living a life with no boundaries. It is a book of liberality and experience an experiment in liberalism. But when Solomon was old, he wrote the book of Proverbs, which is a book of barriers, a book of walls. And so you learn some things as you grow older, some things that you build around you to insulate yourselves. That doesn't mean that we still can't reach the world. We're, 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 we don't want to, we want to stay in the boat, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And so uh, they felt the need to do these things in order to prosper and move forward, to put some boundaries, to put some walls up. I wrote this third thing down, and that is protection. God defended them against the Ethiopians, and, and it's very, very strange that they gave the number count. They had nearly 580,000. I thought, man, that's a lot of footmen. But then they came up against a, another army that had a million plus 300 chariots. And I like the fact that I'm not preaching this, that, that Asa had enough sense to get to God and get, his, get on his face before God and say, Lord, we can't win this battle without you. We need your help. And I made a little note right here because I didn't want to miss this because I'm talking about not just America and the church and our families and homes, but individual Christians. Let me just stop and say this. Anytime you set out to seek the Lord and you make a covenant with God, you make a promise, a commitment to God that you're going to seek the Lord, I guarantee you, just get ready for the fight. Because Satan doesn't want to see you do that. He'll do everything he can to tear you down and destroy you. And so thus the Ethiopians come, but God is the one that won that battle. And God knew that with all these blessings, and man runs the risk of forsaking God. So he gave them one more thing. If you write this one down, he gave them a preacher. He gave them a preacher. Now I know that you don't believe this, but God gives churches preachers, and God gives nations preachers for a reason, for a blessing. <laughs> I know you all think maybe sometimes in a way, and I'm in the way because you run from me in Walmart, but that's okay. You don't have to do that. So God sent, chapter 15, verse 1, He sent the prophet Azariah to warn King Asa. And though the liberals think that preachers stand in the way of progress, and it is this thought that's caused many to become conformist. Um, they no longer preach on sin. And uh, have you ever had just a preacher get up and just say a bunch of things but not say anything? Man, if I'm going down through there in the Bible and it's a sin, I'm going to name it. But there's a lot of folks that won't do that, and it's just the world we're living in. They become conformist preacher brethren, and they stop preaching, and they start sharing. But remember, it is the fiery preachers of this nation that keeps America on track. Boy, that's what we need. I need... Wouldn't you like to see some of these guys on TV just come out swinging? I could just picture Joel Osteen. I said, just picture him coming out. Anyway, I don't know if he can smile. Now I'm just saying that uh, love us or hate us, in the end, God gives nations and churches, men of God, to keep us from forgetting. And that's what this man did. He came along. We see seeking the Lord, Judah's reward for seeking the Lord. And then we see Judah's reminder in seeking the Lord. Judah's reminder. Uh, we won't read through these again, but along comes this preacher, uh, Azariah, and the son of Oded, and he begins, he's filled with the Spirit of God, and he begins preaching, and he reminds him of some things. He says, uh, he went out to meet Asa, and he said, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. So he's preaching the whole crowd, but especially to Asa. He said, The Lord is with you. You ought to underline this in your Bible. The Lord is with you while you be with him. If ye seek him, he will be found of you. And if you forsake him, he'll forsake you. We're the ones that goes first. He gives this reminder. He says, uh, he says in verse number 
3, he said, Now for a long season, Israel, that is your sister nation, had been without the true God, without the teaching priests, without the law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel, which they did only a few times, and sought him, he was found of them. He said here, here's a reminder, the preacher comes along, he said, he said, now for a long season, she has, Israel has been without the true God. Boy, I don't, want ever, I don't want America ever to go one year without a knowledge of who the true God is. But understand we're in danger of that more than ever before because we have this, this multiple gods out there that, that a lot of these things are taking root in our nation because the preachers won't preach the gospel. They won't preach the truth. And won't name who the true God is. I mean, name it and claim it. It's Jehovah God, the God of the Bible. And the, uh, America needs to hear that one more time. And Israel had been without the true God. They'd had him, turned her back on him. For a long season, the Bible says there she had no priest, no, no priest to teach them the, the Word of God. For a long season, she had uh, not had the Bible, the law, the Bible says here. Verse number 4 Verse number 5, in those times there was no peace to, to him that went out and nor that came in. Great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. They didn't have him. They didn't have the, the Word of God. They didn't have a, no one to teach them the Bible. You see, after the death of Solomon, the nation was divided. And the first thing that Jeroboam did, this new king of Israel, was cast out all the good priests. He got rid of all of them, fired them. He replaced these godly men with occultist priests, pagan type priest without the priest they had no law they had no Bible so then he set up idols for the people to worship Dr. A.C. Dixon is in heaven now but he writes this regarding this passage and I'm quoting now without the priest and the scribe Israel had no Bible if anyone wanted to know the law in those days they had nowhere to turn but today thank God we have his law we have his word in the Bible the law is God's standard of what is right and wrong, but the vast majority of people take their standard from the media, from the newspaper, the radio, the television, and from the movie house. God's standard has been rejected, and the world's or man's or the devil's standard has been substituted. And that's why our society today has become increasingly corrupted. The great need of today is to get back to the Bible, the true standard, the only book which contains the authentic revelation of God and of His love and His grace and His Son and His way of saving men and women, boys and girls. I'm just saying, here's a man that's gone now that's writing probably 30-some years ago that says we need to forget about getting our theology and how we walk from, uh, from, from the television and from Hollywood and from the movies and get back to the Bible. You'd be surprised the number of Christians today that formulate their philosophy of life and their theology and what they think of God based upon what Hollywood produces. You and I know better than that. We are Bible-believing Christians. We've got a Bible that teaches us all about God, all He wants us to know about Him. So without the true God, Israel experienced no peace in the daily lives, vexations from the other countries. They were overrun with atheism. Nations destroyed nations. Cities destroyed cities. But Azariah said to the king Asa, he said, The Lord is with you. He said, That's not true with you. Now, you were heading that way until the other king died, but God put you in. That's not true with you. And he said this He said, uh, While you be with him, and if you'll seek him, he'll be found of you. I want you to see the importance. I trust you'll see the importance of, of all of us seeking God. Sometimes you think, Well, the preacher's supposed to seek God. No, all of us are to seek God. But we, America needs to seek God. One more time. Interestingly, in verse 4, the Bible says that even when wicked Israel turned to God in their trouble, he was found of him. Trouble is intended to drive people to God, not away from him. By the way, here's a great truth. Any nation, any Christian who will seek after the Lord can be found of him. I'm thinking right now of Papua New Guinea, a very, very dark nation. It was without the Lord. But here just several years ago, they instituted and voted in a very Christian parliament. Strange things are happening there. You saw some of the video footage right here, how they have sanctioned BIMI and American missionaries to put the Word of God in every public school in Papua New Guinea. Amen. By the way, they're over there now. They have already made their first distribution, nearly, nearly 400,000 uh, Bibles that they're giving to the youth of that nation. 
Boy, would to God we could do that in America, amen? amen. I'm just saying uh, anybody that seeks after God can be found of Him. And that doesn't matter how far you've gone and what you've done in your life. If you'll turn around and seek after God, you'll find Him. See, so you ought to, and you ought to do that while He can be found. I mean, while you're, you're not too far gone. And so the Bible teaches us here a tremendous principle that we can be found. God can be found of us. Judah's reminder, don't be like Israel. Forget and forget the God of peace and prosperity and protection. Forget the God that gave you everything that you had. Now think of this right now. If you have reasonable harmony in your home, there, is no, there are no perfect homes, no perfect marriages. But if you've got reasonable harmony in your marriage and your home and you're being basically provided for, you ought to jump up and down and shout glory, hallelujah. Be reminded tonight that that came from Almighty God God has a way. If we just obey Him in the simple truth of seeking after Him in the Word of God and prayer and trying to obey Him and just do what's right and live the life of faith, He has a way of putting His field, a force field, you might say, around you and just making things work out. Thank God for that. He did that with Judah here. America's reminder, don't be like your sister nation. I don't know if you want to call it that or who, which one came first or whatever. I think we could say this, don't be like England that we sprung from, you might say, and don't be like them and forsake God. Remember now, at the turn of the century, if you read anything about history, England was in the middle of a great revival that was felt worldwide. worldwide. I had to kind of validate what I just said at the turn of the century because we're living in 2000 now. I'm talking about the turn of the century, 1800 to 1900. You know, there, there, there was life before the year 2000. But I remember those days and reading after those things and missionaries were sent out by the thousand. This revival was full-blown. It was an, an era that gave the world the greatest evangelists and preachers and large churches were built to house all those converts. Then came World War II. It was a bloody time. But God gave England and America and other nations a victory. England rebuilt her cities and her economy and she flourished again with prosperity and peace, but she failed to rebuild her love for God. It's sad now today, England, for a long season, you might say, has been without the true God. And America, who is infatuated right now with other countries instead of being in love with God, is chasing after some of the same things. Can I just say that Europe used to be the hotbed for revival? You read it in history. Those revivals set the fires of revival going in, in America, but they started in Europe. Watch what's going on. Watch what the trends are now. Everybody in America, not everybody, but most of the folks in our leadership, they always they want to do things like they do in Europe. I don't want to do like, like they did in Europe. We build our cars like them. I remember I was in Rome a few years ago, and, and you, didn't, you didn't parallel park your car. You didn't. Well, if you wanted to, you could. The cars were so little, you could parallel park it or park it straight in. They're the same, they're the same length as they were the width. Beep, beep, you know, if you had a car, and if you had a place to park. And the streets are straight up, the, wall, the uh, buildings are straight up, and if you found a way place, if you didn't, you rode, a, you rode a bicycle. If you didn't have a bicycle, you walked. Oh, yeah, man, I, I want to be like Europe, don't you? We, I just told our staff the other day, we've got four or five vans left out there, the old, the old style big boxy vans, and our insurance company keeps saying, those are not, they, you know, need to get rid of those. You need to get the new, well, they, the, 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 the European look. It's like you go down and you pull up to pick up some kids and instead of blowing your horn, honk, honk, it's nah, 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 nah. They can't even make a siren right over there. I'll be a little sarcastic. I know I'm American. And God's blessed America because we stuck with God after the war. In fact, we did finally have our revivals, Amen. I'm just saying, let's be reminded, the preacher's trying to remind them, don't walk away from God. If you'll stick with God, he'll stick with you. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. That's what I'm talking about. And now I get to the root of my message, and that is that Judah's seeking of the Lord brought a resolution. Brought a resolution. The preacher in verses 8 through 15 comes to a conclusion 
he finishes his message in verse number 8, verse number 7. He says, I want you to be strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak or slack, you might say, or quit, for your work shall be rewarded. He said, stick this thing out. Verse 8, the preacher's done. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oda the prophet, he took courage and put away, he began to do something, he put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah and Benjamin out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim. He renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. He gathered all Benjamin, Judah and Benjamin together and uh, several things happened here. We see Judah's resolution because of their seeking of the Lord. The preacher finishes preaching his message and he, you might say he makes an invitation King Ace is on the front row, and I don't know if he said what we said. Now, every head bowed, every eye closed. Now, I just told you if you seek the Lord, he'll be with you. He'll be found. And I told you if you, you'll not forsake him, he won't forsake you. Now, may God speak to your heart, and I can just see Asa raise his hand. Get up out of his seat and come to the altar, you might say. He says, that message was for me. Maybe he turned around and testified and said, we're going to make some changes around here. The Bible says he took courage. That means he got bold in seeking the Lord. That means he got bolder in pleasing the Lord. He didn't care who he upset. And immediately he made about seven different changes. I want you to jot these down. I hope I got them all here. He made seven different changes here. First of all, he started his reformation. He restarted his reformation, casting out the rest of the idols of the land. He restarted his reformation, casting out the rest of the idols of the land. I mean, he had started this thing earlier in verses 1 through 3. And he gets over here, and they'd taken some more land. And so he said, we're going to throw the idols out of those lands. And then secondly, he rebuilt the altar of God in the house of God. Actually, the true altar was in the a holy place. Uh, the holy place, but it, literally what he renewed was the porch of the temple, and that's where the people, the common people would come, and they'd present their sacrifice at the brazen altar. There's a quick little note here you might want to make. It may be in your life as you make a, a commitment, a recommitment to God, it may be that you need to rebuild the altar in your life. Where, where is your family altar? Where is your personal altar? Where is that place that you meet the Lord? Where is that place that you open the Word of God and you get on your knees and you pray your, through your prayer list before God, maybe you don't have that anymore. Maybe you used to have that, but you don't have it. You got away from that. And here's something that, that the man of God did. He said, I, I'm going to restart cleaning house. And maybe that's something you need to do, that make a reformation. Maybe there's things you need to get out of your video cabinet. You need to get out of your CD library. Some books maybe you need to pull down off your shelves because they're not of God. Maybe them, some magazine subscriptions you need to cancel. Maybe some websites that you need to block out of your computer. Amen, preacher. That's good right there. Maybe something that you're following or someone that you're following on your whatever network, social network, that, that's, that's taking you the wrong direction. He said, I'm going to restart this reformation. Then he said, I'm going to rebuild the altar, and it may be today that's what you need to do. Find your prayer closet one more time. Find that place, that sweet place where God meets with you. Rebuild that thing. I thought, wrote the third thing down. He rallied the people to worship God again. Notice uh, verse number 9. He gathered them together, all Jude and Benjamin, Watch what he says, and the strangers with him out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord, his God, was with him. Ladies and gentlemen, please understand that whenever they saw, when pagan Israel saw that the Lord was with Judah, that was exciting to them. I personally believe that people began flocking to Judah out of Israel. And I also believe, and I have this written in my Bible, this little note right here, this happens with a church too. When people in dead denominational churches see that God is with you and your church, they will come. And they will, and they did today. Amen. And they do just about every week. 
Because I think the closer we get to the return of the Lord, people are seeking the Lord. I told you years ago that the closer we get to the rapture, God's going to shake the rug, and true born-again Christians are going to find a house of God that preaches the Word of God and does what's right. Amen. The only thing we got to do is seek after the Lord. Don't stop and stay with it. The way you can tell if the Lord is with you is not the outward blessings of God, but the evidence of holy living and separation from the world. I put a little footnote in here. This is strange, but I wrote this fourth thing down. They rendered their offering to the Lord. They rendered their offering to the Lord. People get hung up on this, but the Bible says here that they uh, gathered themselves together. Verse 11, and they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had brought, 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep. They, that's just a lot of sacrifice. And I will tell you this, that when we begin to get to the place where we want to make a commitment and covenant with the Lord, He wants everything. He wants our gift. And there's a lot of Christians who get all hung up about the money part of it. But when you make that covenant with the Lord... That's not a problem. Or with this fifth thing down, they renewed their covenant, and this is probably the crux of the whole message. The Bible says this in verse number 12, And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. Isn't that what we're told in the New Testament over and over? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and strength in one place. And can I just say this? That there, there, this, is old, this is Old Testament teaching New Testament doctrine. In other words, there's a time that we need to understand, as I preached this a few weeks ago, that God wants us all lock, stock, and barrel. And you may not know this, He has all of you anyway. Amen. You just need to acknowledge it. He gives you the very breath in your lungs. So they renew their covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and their soul. And this is what God's people today should desire to do. Yet this is what most people are afraid to do. Today, people will not commit to God. And, and more and more I'm seeing this as time goes on. They'll not make a promise to God. Uh, they're, they're either too selfish to do that, they're too busy to do that, or they're afraid they're going to have to give up something, some relationship, some lifestyle, some habit. So they know that they're not going to follow through. And so they just kind of slough it off saying, well, I don't want to lie to God. Now, I've heard that before which is worse, trying to change and failing or rebelling to change and not trying, which is worse, trying to change and failing or rebelling to change and not trying. God says to obey is better than sacrifice. And I'd rather try and fail as rebel and buck on God. Excuse me. You say, well, the Bible says it's better not to vow a vow than to vow a vow and not pay. So I'm not making God any promises. Well, then don't tell your wife that you can't keep a promise. Don't tell your husband you can't keep a promise. Don't, don't tell the bank you can't keep a promise. Don't tell your employer you can't <clears throat> keep a promise. Now, the reason most Christians don't make a covenant to seek the Lord like, like these people did in this passage is because they don't want to. And that's where we're living today. Everybody will make all kinds of other commitments to everything else. They'll commit to make a car payment, commit to make a house payment, commit to work a job. They'll commit to do this, commit to do that, commit to HOA fees, commit to keeping their grass mowed, commit, 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 commit to taking care of their dogs and feeding them and their cats and their parakeets and all that, but they won't commit to God. I wrote this where we're at, sixth thing down. They relinquish their lives to seek the Lord. Now, this is tough. They're sacred honor. The Bible says in verse number 13 that whosoever would not seek the Lord, God of Israel, should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. Now, that's tough. And by the way, this reminds you, this is Old Testament, not New Testament. We don't kill people that go back on God. But this is what their desire was. All of the people that were in this situation said, we are committed to the fact that what we have is because of God. And we're going to follow Him with all of our heart. God's not going to ask you to do something you can't do. I've been saved since I was a six-year-old boy, 
and I've been serving the Lord and surrendering to the Lord since, since uh, long before I was married and made commitments after I was married. And here I am now, as old as I am, I'm going to stop telling my age. And I haven't turned back. Amen. Well, you say, well, you're, you're the preacher. Well, I know a lot of preachers that turn back. I talk to them a lot. That has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with my commitment. I was serious about it. I was genuine, sincere. Amen. That's what God's asking here. And then number seven, they rejoiced that the Lord was with them. <laughs> this is where it leads to, verse 14, And they swear in the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting, with trumpets and cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with their heart, all their heart, and sought him with their whole desire. And he was found of them. Read this last phrase in verse 15 with me. The very last phrase in verse 15. Ready? And the Lord gave them rest round about. Wow. All because they made a covenant to seek the Lord their God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. It's time that God's people stop fearing commitment. I mean, how do we run our buses? How do we, how do we have a choir here? How do we even have Sunday school if people don't commit to taking a class or taking a chair in the choir or playing an instrument or driving a bus or being a bus captain? And can, can I say that we don't need less of that? We need more of that. Commitment. Commitment. And I want to ask you tonight to just evaluate your own life of the things that you do make commitments for. Where's your spiritual commitment? Where is that level? If you're ever going to get any victory in your Christian life and rejoice as these folks do, you're going to have to stop. You stop running your life and let the Lord run your life. And let me ask you tonight, do you enjoy the blessings of God? Are you seeking the Lord in your life, honestly trying to cast out those things that don't please Him and taking on those things that do please Him? I'm continually doing that. This, this, wor this world, the flesh and the devil will creep on you and, and, and he'll introduce things to you and, and without even knowing, you'll, you'll kind of you'll fundamentalize it or you'll make it religiousize it or you'll make, you make it kind of, well, I, I think that's probably okay. And then if you don't evaluate yourself and, and, and make commitments to God, if you're not careful, that'll continue and drag you down. And so there are periods where I make an evaluation where I let the Lord speak to my heart about things and I, I give up things and turn some things back over the Lord. I reopen some areas maybe that I did not know I closed off from God. And can I say those are very, very important because you and I are headed to the promised land. And I want to ask you tonight very seriously as your pastor, would you be willing, if you've never done this, to make a covenant to the God of your fathers that you're going to seek after Him? By seeking after Him, I'm talking about you've got a, you've got a personal time in the Word of God. You're, you've, got a, you've got a private prayer life. You've got a, the, an anxious heart that seeks after the Lord, that you're faithful to His promises, that you're faithful to His, His commandments, that you're in the house of God and you're listening to the preached Word of God, the taught Word of God, and you're, you're trying to grow in grace. And I want to ask you tonight, if you have not done so, would you make a covenant or would you remake a covenant to seek after the Lord God of your fathers? I'm asking you, will you do that? And if not, would you be willing to work at whatever it is that's stopping you from seeking the Lord? I'm kind of giving you an out, but, I, but I, at the same time, I'm not. I'm asking you, if you can't do that, then you evaluate what's stopping you from doing that. And you'll begin to work on clearing whatever that is out of the way. Let's stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm talking about seeking after the God of our fathers. Father, thank you tonight for your word and for the story of Asa. We are thrilled to read about this man of God. Even more so, we're happy to see how you bless these people with a simple act of seeking after you with all their heart. I'm asking a big question tonight of the people that I love. I like to think that everybody has made a promise to you. Covenant sounds like such a strong word, but so does promise is what it means, a commitment. 
Father, tonight would you speak to hearts one by one by one and maybe some tonight need to recommit to following after you. Maybe some tonight need to search and find out what's stopping that. And I pray you'll bless us please tonight in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed and folks are coming right now. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or anything like that. And I know that sometimes coming to church can be like entertainment. You just kind of, okay, it's over now. I'm going to turn the switch off in my mind. Don't do that. Please don't do that tonight. The best way I know how, I preached the Word of God and showed you an area where God says, if you'll chase after me, I'll let you find me. I'm talking to people who's been here for a lot of years. And something's changed. I can't judge you in that, but I just know something's changed. And it could be this very thing right here, your, your commitment, your covenant, your promise to God. Tonight, if you're here and you're not sure that heaven's your home, you're in the best place you can be to come to Christ. We'll have somebody on the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. They'd like to take that Bible and show you how you can become a born-again Christian tonight. We want you to come. Lord, speaking to your heart about baptism, church membership. If you'll just come and see these men, they'll take you through every bit of that tenderly. If you're a, a lady, they'll have a lady talk with you. Let's let the Lord work tonight. Father, bless as we sing. Speak to the hearts of your people. Help us, Lord. We sing the song, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, and some have. And they need to recommit. Bless us as we sing tonight this invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're singing right now. You come, would you? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The prophet said in Isaiah 55, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I believe he's near tonight. The very next verse says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Seek the Lord. Let's sing another verse. You lead us, Brother Pearson, would you? Love no one find me. Still I will follow, though no one join me, still I will follow, though no one join me, still I will follow, though no turning back, no turning back. You may be seated in the place softly. Father, thank you again for your word, and I pray you'll help us to make those commitments. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Christian life is a life of commitment. Trust that God will speak to your heart about all. It's good to have Nathan Lyons right over here. Nathan, could you stand? He's been coming for a long time, very faithful, and you've been saved and baptized. It's your desire to join our church, transfer your letters. Is that right? You rejoice his decision to do that. Would you say amen? amen. Maybe see you there, Nathan. God bless you. We thank God for him, and very active up in the Cross Point class there, and and he has a great testimony. Happy to have him part of our church. Hope you'll welcome him and, uh, and greet him here.
Uh, I, I think I failed to mention this. I don't believe I did. But if you're a guest tonight, why don't you just take just a moment, look in the seat back pocket in front of you. You'll find a connection card. looks something like this. We'd love you to pull that out right now. I should have mentioned this earlier. I'd love you, for you to take just a moment and fill that out and give us just as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. And then, uh, you know, you can take that out by the information area. You can leave it right there if you want to. I'm not sure if there would be anybody there or not. Or you can bring it by me or so whatever. But uh, we want to get uh, just a little copy of the fact that you're here tonight, and uh, thank you so much for coming and being part of our church. If I can just take just a moment, Brother Kurt, you got some word here? Okay, take just a moment and let you know what's coming on us now uh, as a church family. We've got, of course, uh, next week I think they're going to start doing some, some digging out back and different things, and so, um, and then that's going to progress through the rest of the end of the summer, and so there'll be some changes uh, going on, and so, and school will start here in just about three weeks and it's just going to be a m massive logistical change. I don't want to use the word nightmare because we have worked diligently night and day on this for the past couple of weeks. Brother Kramer and I especially, Brother Mosley, Brother Chris, and uh, just, just moving people around. And uh, I just want you to know if you're a teacher in a class, you may be sharing a room for a while with, with uh, school uh, folks. And it, it looks like maybe even the school kitchen uh, temporarily have to be down here the first semester so there'll be some fellowship hall arrangements and so don't automatically think that the fellowship hall may be available and it, it just if you just work with us this should not last longer than one year and I'm just we're about to find out who's Christian who's not <laughs> and I seriously from my heart it, everything's going to be okay I don't want you to just hump up and quit and go to some other church because you didn't get the parking lot or you couldn't drive from one side of the building to the other if you'll wait, that's all going to work out. I, I just I fear that somebody says, well, I had to get in my car and drive from the east parking lot all the way around through Gresham to the back part and come just to get the west side of the parking lot. Sorry. <laughs> get out on Franklin Road and go that way. Just don't come through the bushes over here between the buildings, all right? And uh, th th there's going to be little things like that. You're going to say, do what? Okay, we understand that. But it's excitement, exciting. It's, it's progress. We had a great crowd this morning for a Sunday morning, and the church is doing great, and the school is doing great. And let's just, let's just keep our attitudes and spirit great. And then we have the tent meeting coming up. Now we're working on some things, what we can do, what we can't do. We will be having a tent meeting. So don't, somebody said, oh, they're not going to hear, hear that. Not going to have, we're, we are going to have the tent meeting. It's going to be awesome. We already got the speakers picked out. And we got Benny Hinn, Joe Osteen. We got, we got some real ring dingers. And uh, we're having a great, great time. But there are some things we may or may not be able to do, so we're working through all that. And then on top of that, the old preacher here scheduled the Southwide Independent Baptist Fellowship. It's going to be here in October. Now, that's going to be a great meeting, too. That's for all of us. And so uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it all works through. But I want you to get on board and be praying about. We've got some opportunities for revival to break out here uh, under the tent. And again, uh, in, uh, in October, we've got preachers coming in like uh, Brother Chapel, Scott Polly, John Wilkerson, da David Gibbs, um, I don't, I don't know who, Brother Sexton's coming. We've got a lot of preachers coming in for that meeting, and I'm bringing them here for you. And what, what I'm afraid of, by the way, I'll just say this. Well, there's going to be a lot of people come from all over the eastern United States and the southern part. But if this crowd right here is in this church on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we won't be able to hold everybody. And that's what I want to see. And listen to me, that's what America needs to see. The preacher here, Asa, Asa the king, rallied the people. I'm trying to rally the people. Uh, just got word on this. Sunday's our day, and Sunday morning, I've got Don Sis coming on Sunday morning. He just agreed to come. Sunday night, I've got Brother Bobby Robertson coming over just for our people on Sunday night. And so it's going to get, it's going to get exciting around here. And so let's enter into this phase I remember when my wife and I had a chance to build our first house. How excited I was when that, when that backhoe first came out there and started digging that fresh soil. I mean, that was just so exciting. For the time, it, it, got, it started wearing on me about six months into it. But, but still, when we were able to walk in that thing and smell the new fresh sheetrock. And can I just say that I've always been like that. I get excited about times like this. It's a lot of work on everybody. I just want you to be patient. And let's look at it as progress because that's exactly what it is. Brother Kurt, come back.
pretty exciting. Tomorrow we'll be excited about it as well. I'm uh, clarification. I think preacher already clarified some of the things too, but but uh, we do want you to go. We do want you to be involved with the uh, ice skating and all that. That if just stop by the information table so we have an account of approximately how many will be there. And then also, if my daughter talked to you about being over here in this meeting as well, not just the list of names I mentioned, if you'll meet with her just for a few moments. Yeah, yes, yes. And we also do need help this evening. If you can stick around and help, we need to decorate in here in the auditorium. If you would help with that, that'd be uh, a pleasant experience too. Thank you. <laughs> Let's stand together. It's been a wonderful time to be in the house of the Lord. And I hope God spoke to your heart as he did to mine. Hymn number, oh, you don't need the hymn number. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he can do for you. Sing it together. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. Uh, I think Sloan's Honda is letting us use some of their equipment over here, so look, but don't ride. Amen. Have a wonderful night. Thank you for coming to church. God bless you.